So, hello there. Um, can you hear me? Can you see me? I need some feedback because, well, I clearly can't see you. Can anyone see me? Can anyone hear me? Um, if you can, please type something in the chat so I know that it's actually working. Yes, working. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, I'll let you know we've got a 10 second time delay from when I'm speaking till I can actually tell you can see it. So. Um, when you ask a question, it might take me a while to respond, but we'll figure that out. We're just going to wait for a couple of people to join, and then we can get started. Okay, so, okay, shall we get started? Well, okay, uh, I'm going to welcome you all to this uh, slightly odd for the current circumstances physiology lecture. Um, I'd much rather wish we could do it in person because um, I'd like to see you. It's also nice to look at people's faces and know that, okay, they've actually understood something or know they're looking at me like, Jesus Christ, what are you talking about? And I have to reiterate some something. So I encourage you all that are watching live right now uh, to use the chat as much as possible. And I've got a tablet next to me, and I'll try to read as we go along and uh, answer your questions. If I'm going too fast or if I haven't explained something properly, uh, please let me know, and I'll reiterate something. And um, yes, without further ado, I think we can get started. Um, so today we're going to be talking about cell physiology, which is a lot of revision initially. And I'm going to try to go through those parts as quickly as possible. So we're going to start off with um, what is a cell? That should be basic revision from biology, but I'm just going to reiterate it a little bit. Um, then we're going to get to the slightly more physiology specific sections. So what are membranes? How do we transport things across membranes? Uh, what type of membrane proteins do we have? And then in the very end, we're going to start looking at a little bit of electrophysiology. We're going to discuss the uh, resting membrane potential, which is the basis for what you're going to do in the next minute lecture uh, for the uh, cellular basis of the nervous system. So, first off, what is a cell? Um, the basics of um, cellular physiology, you've already done that in biology. Uh, for the final exam, there's actually only one question that asks about the functional roles of organelles. Uh, and all the other questions in the final exam regarding cellular physiology are more to do with membranes, transport, and um, then a little bit of electrophysiology. So organelles, I'm going to leave that for you to read up on in case you need. Just go back to your biology notes. Um, I'm going to focus on the things that are important for physiology and biochemistry for this year. In the grand scheme of things, a cell is the most basal functional unit of an organism. That means all the processes that take place there um, determine the function of the relevant organ. Uh, 
Uh, a cell is basically a, a way to maintain a stable environment within a compartment in which reactions then can take place. For example, we can use an example, um, the lysosome. The lysosome has a stable pH of about 4.5, and that stable pH is crucial for the lysosomal enzymes to do their job, so lysosomal degradation, degradation of intracellular proteins, etc. The cell does a similar thing. It accumulates nutrients, amino acids, glucose, all the building blocks that we need for cellular life. It accumulates them, it stores them, and it provides the reaction environment for all the intracellular processes to occur. Um, so organelles, yes, lysosome, mitochondria, again, at a specific reaction space. If you remember from biology, uh, we have the intermembrane space and in where we accumulate a high proton gradient. And that high proton gradient is what drives the generation of ATP. So again, we're talking about a specific compartment like a cell or like the mitochondria that maintains a stable environment to do its function. Another part of uh, cellular physiology that we should discuss is the cytoskeleton. However, the cytoskeleton is more important in the relevant topics further down the line, and you're going to learn more about that in future lectures. Uh, but as a whole, the cytoskeleton can be summed as, as the basis for the cell structure. It is essential for cell movements. So, for example, part of the cytoskeleton is actin myosin, muscle contractions, etc. And also, very importantly, intracellular transport. So if you have a nerve fiber, in the middle of that nerve fiber, we have a lot of microtubule. And along those microtubuli, um, vesicles with neurotransmitter, for example, can be transported. So that is, on a very brief level, the um, yeah, functions of the cell from a physiological standpoint. The how is this environment maintained? And this is where we get to the membrane, the actual probably most important aspect of the cellular physiology itself. And in order to understand more about the membrane, we need to first of all start discussing phospholipids. Again, brief revision. However, I'm going to warn you, there's going to be a lot more detail on this in the biochemistry, especially semester two. So the structure that you're seeing here on the right hand side, uh, that is uh, phosphatidyl serine. I'm going to talk a little bit about the biochemistry of this molecule because it helps understanding the underlying principles of what makes the membrane such a specific part of the cell. The um, I'll just get a um, highlighter quickly. Oops, no, that is the wrong button. Hang on a second, I messed something up. There we go, back we are. Um, there we go, that's what I need. Okay, so if we're looking at... Um, this part. This is serine. For us, it's not important right now. This is the phosphate. This is glycerol. And these long tails over here and here, that is a fatty acid. I can't really draw that well on the screen. But anyway, so a phospholipid is basically the three grand structures of phosphate, Glycerol as the backbone to which the phosphate and the two fatty acid chains attach. Why do we talk about a polar head and a apolar tail? Now, if you remember from, and we have to go back to biophysics a little bit, uh, bonding and intermolecular forces. What type of intermolecular forces can we actually accomplish within a phospholipid such as this one? Up here, with serine up here, we can form hydrogen bonds, similar with the phosphate, hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds here, hydrogen bonds practically everywhere on the left half of this molecule. Everywhere you can see an oxygen, you can attach theoretically hydrogen. What bonds there? Standard classical example is water. So the top half of this molecule has an extremely high affinity for water, whereas the bottom part, all the things you see here, that's just hydrogen. And hydrogen attached to a carbon uh, doesn't really form any bonds except something called van der Waals interactions. These forces are extremely weak. Van der Waals interactions is basically just two molecules, if they lie very close to one another, the momentary dipoles of what is called, if you want to look it up, um, 
form a very weak attraction, and that's the only sort of bond that they can form. If we had a water molecule down here, it couldn't form any bond. So from an energetical point of view, it would be a very bad place for the water molecule to be. So it will rapidly travel back up here where it has a lot of sites where it could attach to intermolecularly. In conclusion, that means this part of the molecule, very high affinity for water. This part of the molecule with the two side chains, no affinity for water whatsoever. The polar section and the apolar section. Now, with the apolar section, what type of bonding can we form here? The only type of bonding we can form here is said one of those interactions, but with what? If we look at more than one phospholipid, I'm going to try to draw a phospholipid down here. Um, theoretically, we can stack phospholipids side by side, and these fatty acid side chains, so this part of the molecule, um, they can interact with one another. So they have a weak attraction to one another. And that generates the polar orientation of the membrane itself. You have phospholipids stacked next to one another. And when you get to a sufficient number of phospholipids, you can either have a micelle, which is basically a round structure of phospholipids where all the tails point to the middle. And when you have even more phospholipids, then we can talk about the next structure, which is the plasma membrane, where you have phospholipids on top and the bottom. More details about all of this in biochemistry in the second semester, but that should be enough for the basics. I hope uh, I'm clear so far, and I hope you're all following along. If not, please let me know in the comments, and I'll try to get back to you. Also, if you have more specific questions about anything, uh, I think we're going to have plenty of time left over at the end, so we'll figure something out. Anyway, so off to the next part, the plasma membrane itself. The plasma membrane is what su surrounds the cell and the organelles. It is roughly uh, 7.5 to 10 nanometers thick, depending on the length of the fatty acid side chains. And the general composition of the cell membrane itself, I took that data from Guyton, by the way. Surprisingly enough, there's actually more than half proteins. If you look at the diagram on the right-hand side, you're going to see that um, practically everywhere scattered proteins, 25% phospholipids, 13% uh, cholesterol. I'm going to get back to the role of cholesterol later. 4% other lipids, such as sphingosine. Sphingosine is another type of phospholipid, but it is not crucial for most of our physiological purposes, but you're going to learn about more of that in biochemistry as well. And then 3% carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are either attached to the phosphate itself, like for example, this one, is a carbohydrate, or to membrane-bound proteins. Now, um, last point that we need to discuss when we talk about cellular membranes is the membrane fluidity. Um, we have to explain the fluidity. We have a, a very helpful model, something called the fluid mosaic model, which basically tells us that we have free lateral movement of the molecules within a membrane. So the molecules on the slide before, they can move this molecule here can move to this side, it can move this way, can move that way. However, it cannot flip to the other side. That is very difficult because the polar head has to overcome the intermolecular forces of the apolar side chains, and it doesn't like to do that. So lateral movement is fine. Flip-flop movement is energetically difficult. We can, however, achieve flip-flop movement by something called flipase, which is an enzyme that just flips phospholipids upside down. Now, the fluid mosaic model is based on an experiment of which I actually don't remember the name. However, the principle is you have two cells, cell A, cell B. And uh, if you look at the diagram before, you remember that you had small carbohydrates attached to phosphates. You can actually do that with two different types of carbohydrates that have a distinct color. That means you could theoretically color membranes of two different cells. And if we cause those two cells to fuse, then the membranes of those two cells will become one. And all of the phospholipids, they will move freely laterally. And after roughly 40 minutes in this example, the differently colored phospholipids will have dispersed completely. Why would you need to flip phospholipid? Um, that is uh, a good question. You're going to learn about that in biochemistry, but I'm going to make a quick excursion. Um, when you synthesize 
membrane brand proteins. Um, in order for the protein to be displayed at the top end of the um, membrane, you require the flipping of the entire section of the membrane sometimes. Or you can flip individual proteins, but that's also a uh, difficult process. But in general, uh, if you, for example, have a specific signaling molecule attached to a phosphate, that phosphate needs to be flipped to the outside of the cell in order for it to be visible to the extracellular space. So in that scenario, it'd be very useful to flip-flop a phospholipid. Okay, now, I hope that's clear. If not, we can discuss more later. Um, that is the basic principle of the fluid mosaic model. Now, basically, uh, phospholipids move freely laterally. The fluidity of the membrane itself is quite important as well, actually, because fluidity of the membrane is dependent on a lot of factors. First factor is the temperature. Um, if you use butter as an example, butter is nothing but a fat, but it's a very hard fat because at room temperature, uh, well, at fridge temperature technically, it is quite a solid block. But when you heat it up just a little bit, you will start to break the intermolecular forces of the individual fatty acid chains. Fatty acid chains, like we've seen before, and the butter will become practically an oil. Something similar happens when we talk about phospholipids. I'm going to draw another phospholipid. Um, you overcome the interactions of the side chain, this one, when you increase the temperature, because then the energy they have to overcome the intermolecular forces is greater. So with increased temperature, increased movement. Now, this is not the only part, because um, when you think about an oil, a very short-chained oil, for example, I don't know, a very short-chained carbohydrate itself, uh, carbohydrates you have a carbon, you have a carbon, and you have a couple of hydrogens attached. This is ethane. Ethene is a gas. The longer the chain is, if we attach more carbons to this chain, the more van der Waals interactions we will have between the individual chains, and the more likely it is to become a fluid, and after even longer chains, a solid. Something similar applies here. The longer the chain is, the more intermolecular force forces you have to overcome to neighboring phospholipids, and the fluidity of the membrane will decrease. So this is dependent on the type of phospholipid. We have various different types depending on A, the carbohydrate attached to the phosphate, but also the two fatty acid chains attached at the bottom. The longer the chain, the lesser the fluidity. The last part that determines fluidity is cholesterol. Cholesterol, depending on the concentration, can either increase or decrease the fluidity. The specific mechanisms, I will leave that to biochemistry because for our purposes, they're not important. But as a whole, this is all the membranous functions covered for now. Now, for the next part, membrane permeability, we discussed the Side chains of phospholipids are extremely apolar, and uh, so we have very little, very few molecules that can actually freely move across that membrane. The only things that can move freely across the membrane are small uncharged molecules here at the bottom. That is oxygen. Oxygen diffuses in water or blood, and when it hits a cell membrane, it can just diffuse freely. Similar carbon dioxide, nitrogen, ammonia, which is very important as well, because ammonia is a toxin which is used in the body, but more biochemistry. Alcohol as well, again, biochemistry. However, that is the basic cover. You have very small, often gases, molecules that can freely diffuse. Anything else that is remotely polar, so sodium, for example, it is a tiny atom. But because of its polarity, it can interact very well with the phosphate heads, but it does not voluntarily move across the um, membrane. Same with all the other charged ions, potassium, chloride, calcium, and funnily enough, water itself. Water itself, not to 100%, it can move in small amounts, but water by itself does not voluntarily move across a phospholipid bilayer. Even more so, larger water-soluble molecules such as amino acids, sugars, proteins, nucleotides, no chance. We need transporters. 
And that is where the next section will be on. So we've discussed what the membrane is and what the membrane can do, but now we need to discuss, okay, how do we actually get individual molecules or nutrients into the cell? The two most basic concepts of those are osmosis and diffusion. Osmosis, in layman's terms, is the water, movement of water and water alone, or technically also cell phones, but water for physiology. The movement of water from a area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. This right here. A semi-permeable mem semi membrane means that this membrane is only permeable for water. If we use this beaker as an example, on the left side, we have very few, say, sugar molecules. On the right side, we have a lot more. Relatively speaking, the water concentration on this side of the beaker will be lower. So water will start to move via osmosis through the semi permeable membrane. Diffusion for the sugar molecules is not possible because this membrane is impermeable. So as a net effect, the water will move from the left side of the beaker to the right side. This definition up here, I took it from guidance, is perfectly sufficient for the exam. However, theoretically, it is not 100% accurate because it disregards a lot of biochemical and physical principles. So if you want to find out more about this, we can either discuss it at the end of the lecture or you can do some Googling about something called the salvation shell, which is basically that all things that are dissolved in the solution have a uh, natural tendency to accumulate a sort of shell of water molecules and then drag it around with them. But that is way outside the scope of what we need for physiology, so we can leave that for another time. Um, why is the movement of water so important now? Um, if we, for example, have a cell and the cell has an increased concentration of solutes, for example, like sugar or sodium, in that case, the cell will start to swell and we'll have something called edema. A very prominent example is if you have a cellular edema in the brain because of altered extracellular or intracellular concentrations of respective ions the exact nature of which comes further down the line, but that's just an outlook to what you're gonna learn in the future. The second simple and passive way of moving stuff across a membrane would be, oh yeah, that's by the way, a uh, hydration shell. The other way, ah, I wish I would have put a different diagram there. I wanted to put another diagram, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, diffusion. You have a box. Imagine you have a box filled with water and you add a drop of dye, like food coloring in here. The drop, like we are seeing over here, will after a while diffuse across the entire box and it'll be evenly spread across the entire system. Now, why is that? If you remember back from biophysics, every molecule, every substance has an innate movement to it. This is the thermal movement due to the fact that any temperature is higher than zero degrees to Kelvin. And the molecules will just vibrate slightly and at higher energies, they'll just move freely. So in the case of the dye, the dye will move freely across the system. And after a given amount of time, like in the bottom box over here, it'll be spread equally across the entire system. For our physiological context, the example would be, we have a cellular membrane and say we added a small transporter for sodium ions. If we had a lot of sodium ions over here and very few sodium ions over here, then sodium ions after a while will wander through the channel to the other side and after a while the concentrations on either side will equalize. That is the fundamental principle of diffusion. What is the difference between osmosis and diffusion? Diffusion is based on the thermal movement of particles, whereas osmosis is a different physical principle. So you should not have those two confused. Osmosis, only water. Diffusion, anything else. Both passive transporters, sorry, both uh, passive transport processes. Now, I said we cannot move charged particles across a membrane by themselves. So now we need to talk about membrane proteins and transporters. Before I continue with this, though, I'm just going to ask you, everything's clear so far. 
If not, please do not hesitate and I will try to clear up some confusion before we move on. I need to wait a little bit for the comments to actually reach me because we have a 10 second time delay, apparently. If not, I will move on. No, it's looking good. Okay, in case I've lost any of you, we can easily recap something later. Membrane proteins. As you saw on the slide before, the membrane is 55% proteins, actually, not just phospholipids. We can classify those proteins into two distinct classes, peripheral proteins up here and integral proteins. Integral proteins are proteins that are locked within the membrane itself. There is different locking mechanisms that allow proteins to attach to the membrane. For peripheral proteins, these proteins, such as this blue one right here, is attached to another protein, this protein here, which is an integral protein. This peripheral protein can be washed away easily, whereas integral proteins cannot be washed away unless you destroy the entire membrane. Integral proteins, we can classify them into multiple distinct groups as well. So integral proteins, we have something called transmembrane proteins. That is proteins B and C right here. You can see that we have this section, which is called an alpha helix. If you remember from biology, we have alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. The alpha helix has a hydrophobic section in the middle and that allows it to sit very comfortably in the intermembrane space. We can either have a mono-spanning uh, segment or a mono-spanning uh, integral membrane protein, or we can have a multi-membrane-spanning uh, transmembrane protein. Then the uh, next group would be group D, which is this one here. You can see that it doesn't actually reach across the entire membrane. It is called a monotopic membrane protein but it is still attached tightly within the membrane because of the hydrophobic sections at this part of the protein. Then the last two, they're a bit less important for us right now, but I still mention them, are proteins that are directly attached to either a phospholipid or proteins that have a small fatty acid chain like this one here attached at the bottom. And they will also lock tightly within that membrane. Now, what are these proteins good for? Um, again, channels, but also cellular, uh, cell, uh, signal mechanisms, um, membrane integrity, so for the intra and extracellular uh, skeleton to attach to. So we can think, for example, of desmosomes, um, stuff like that. You remember probably most of those from biology anyway. Um, now we're going to start talking about how we actually transport non-membrane passable items across a membrane. The most basic uh, membrane transporter that we have is called a pore. A pore is nothing but a hollow tube that spans the entire membrane. So it's a very nice diagram. I borrowed from Boron here, actually. We can see you have the inside and the outside of a phospholipid bilayer. This is a phospholipid. And in this case, this is an aquaporin, by the way. Um, the water molecules will be able to slip through the yellow channel that you can see in the middle. Pores, from a physical point of view, is literally just a hollow tube sitting within the membrane. Pores can be selective, for example, in the case of aquaporins, but they can also be non-selective. A other prominent example would be the nuclear pore complex. If you remember, biology, the nuclear envelope has small nuclear pores through which uh, mRNA and uh, nucleotides can pass, and they can actually allow for the diffusion of um, molecules up to the size of 45 kilodaltons. That is massive for a cell, at least, or for a transporter. Aquaporins, on the other hand, are extremely selective. Aquaporins only allow for the diffusion of water, and without few exceptions, hardly nothing else. Ions are not permitted, and that is very important because the uh, ion concentrations on the inside and the outside of the cell needs to be maintained. Pores are always open. There is no gating mechanism. That means if you have a pore, um, the um, <laughs> if you have a pore, 
the pore will sit within the membrane and you cannot regulate it. The only way you could change the transport of whatever the pore is meant to transport is removing the pore itself. Uh, this is applied in the kidneys. In the kidneys, you have something called aquaporins 2, which are only displayed after ADH, antidiuretic hormone, is released by the brain. And in that case, the uh, collecting tubule cells within the kidney will display aquaporins and start retaining water from urine. The slightly more advanced version of this is a channel. The distinction between channel and pore is important. If you are sitting in an oral exam and you confuse a channel and the pore, the examiner is not going to be happy. Both channels and pores work on the principle of passive transport. So transport only by osmosis in the case of aquaporins or diffusion in most other um, channels. Channels normally are selective. For example, we have channels that are specifically selected for sodium and nothing but sodium or for potassium or for calcium and this is actually a marvel of uh, physio like um, like biology because being able to create a protein that only allows a specific atom to pass through i would consider that quite remarkable um, the selectivity is extremely important and we'll find out why later channels in the important distinction between a port and a channel, have something called a lid that can be opened or closed. The lid can be gated by a variety of mechanisms. Those mechanisms include voltage gating. That means if you have a, uh, for example, in a nerve fiber. If you remember from biology, nerve fibers are depolarized and the depolarization triggers voltage gated sodium channels. And that allows the sodium channel to open. Sodium is allowed to diffuse back into the cell along its concentration gradient. And after a short period of time, the channel closes again. Another example would be a ligand-gated channel. Instead of voltage, a ligand, so for example, acetylcholine, an important neurotransmitter, docks at the, pore, at the channel and will cause the channel to open. A last example would be a uh, mechanically gated channel. Um, the exact mechanism of which to us is not important right now, but they are found, for example, in stretch centers. We'll find out more about that in the second semester. The third type, and a uh, very distinct type of transport, is the active transporter, also called ATPases. ATPases because they cleave ATP. The active transporter, or the ATPase, is essentially a tube with two lids. So we have a transporter here. And what is important to remember is that one lid is closed at any given moment. No, it never happens that both lids are opened at the same time because that would counteract the purpose of the channel. The purpose of the active transporter is to move solutes against the concentration gradient. And if both gates were opened, the um, concentration gradient would force the solutes back the way they came and that would be counterproductive. So basically, an active transporter goes through a cyclic change. In this scenario, we have the sodium potassium ATPase. The sodium potassium ATPase takes up three sodiums. Once the three sodiums are docked, ATP will uh, be used up and a small phosphate will still be attached to the transporter. This gate will close. This gate will start to open and sodium is allowed to diffuse out. Now, the gate remains open until two potassium ions insert themselves in the transporter. Then the top gate will close, the bottom gate will open and the potassium is able to move out. That establishes a very strong concentration gradient between sodium and potassium in the intra and extracellular space. This is illustrated here. So the transporter constantly shoves sodium out of the cell and the actual concentration gradient that is established is quite massive. It is 139 to 14 for sodium and 4 to 40, uh, 140 millimoles per liter um, in interstitial and intracellular spaces respectively. Um, this transporter there's a couple of other transporters, but fundamentally, we're only talking about the sodium potassium ATPase is present on every single cell in the body. 
and it establishes the concentration gradient between interstitial and intercellular fluid. It is hugely important. There's other types of ATPases that you're going to come across later in your studies, but the sodium-potassium ATPase is the one you need to remember for now. I explained to you that the sodium-potassium ATPase establishes a very large concentration gradient between sodium and potassium. So on the extracellular slide side, we're going to have a lot of sodium, and on the intracellular side, only very little. Now, if you remember diffusion, sodium wants to move from the extracellular fluid to the intercellular fluid, but it cannot do so without a relevant transporter. So, what do we do? We want to use that transport to, or the diffusion drive, this inertia that pushes sodium through the membrane and use it for something useful. In the intestine, we have a lot of uh, proteins called co-transporter because what do we do in the intestine? We're trying to absorb uh, our food that we, um, our nutrients that we ingested. And we cannot do that simply by diffusion. So what do we do? We use the high sodium concentration outside of, uh, in, the, in the lumen of the intestine. We slot two sodium ions into the transporter. And then we have a co-transport with another solid. For example, in this scenario, glucose. Glucose sits in there, and once all sodium and glucose sits in there, the transporter is going to rotate and transport glucose against its concentration gradient. So it is using the concentration gradient from sodium extra and intracellular to push glucose against its concentration gradient. This is hugely important um, because almost all absorptive processes in the intestine happen that way. Uh, amino acids are transported this way. Glucose is absorbed this way through something called the SGLT1 and 2. It's also found in other places in the body. This is also hugely important in the kidney. We're trying to retain ions. So you're not trying to, every single time uh, you uh, produce urine, you don't want to also wash out all the ions that you have stored in your body, so you need to retain them. So you employ the high luminal sodium concentration to retain other species. This is called secondary active transport. Why active transport? We haven't used any ATP. Well, technically we have used ATP because in order to have this concentration gradient in the first place, the sodium potassium ATPase must have done its work. Um, we can distinguish two types of co-transporters. We can try and distinguish the symporter and the antiporter. The symporter will move two species in the same direction. So in most cases, sodium and something else, for example, glucose. The antiporter will do the reverse. It will use the sodium gradient and expel something for the sodium. So for example, we have a sodium calcium antiporter. It will use three sodiums that go inside. And for those three sodiums that go inside, one calcium will be expelled. This is also quite important. You're going to come across these quite often. Those are the fundamental basics of cellular transport. Now, we are getting to the probably hardest and um, most biophysics related part of this entire lecture. And I'm afraid biophysics, even though it's already a semester ago, is going to haunt you for the entire year because a lot of physiology is mostly biophysics, actually. Um, I mentioned before that we establish a very high concentration gradient between sodium and potassium. Now, if you think about the electrophysiology, we have a lot of, well, we have for every single sodium that we move to the extracellular space, technically we move uh, three sodiums at a given time, three sodiums move out, but only two potassiums move back in. Both have a plus one charge. But in the grand scheme of things, for every cycle that the sodium potassium ATPase does, you're going to have more positive charges on the extracellular side than on the intracellular side. And that establishes a potential difference. Oh, I'm going back the wrong way. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. So I'm going to have a short reminder of what you should remember from biophysics. Um, 
the electrochemical potential difference is the sum of the chemical potential energy and the electrical potential energy. And it is the symbol is V unit is millivolt. Current, the flow of charged particles. So whenever a particle, I'm sorry, that is, nope. I just touched my mouse by accident, I'm sorry. Whenever we have a flow of ions from one side of a membrane to another, say for example, potassium, that is a current. And if you were to attach a voltmeter here, this is a voltmeter, you could measure that current. Uh, last but not least, resistance. This sets the basis for, you're gonna remember this Ohm's formula. Ohm's formula is important for the next slide, but right now we're gonna focus on something else. We're gonna focus on the Nernst equation because as I said, concentration gradient. You can actually determine the potential difference between extra and intracellular space if you know what ion you're measuring and if you know the exact concentrations on the intercellular side and on the extracellular side. RT, so uh, this is a constant, temperature is a constant, Z and F, all constants. The only thing the potential depends on is the concentration intracellular and extracellular. We can do this math. And uh, I uh, just happened to borrow this slide from Professor Dr. Novakova because I actually think this slide is quite excellent. If we do the Nernst equation, for example, potassium, we're getting a result of roughly minus 90 millivolts. Now, why is this number important? I'm going to explain that in a second. I mentioned Ohm's law before. What do we need in order to have a current? A current is the flow of particles. We need a potential difference, that is our concentration gradient, a lot of potassium on the inside of the cell and very little potassium on the outside of the cell that establish our pot potential difference. The resistance, that is our cellular membrane or the respective transporter. Now, the actual action of the sodium potassium ATPase, even though it moves charges from one side to the other, does not generate the actual resting membrane potential. What does generate the membrane potential is the continuous outflow of potassium from a cell because we have something called a leaky channel, a leaky potassium channel that selectively channels potassium extracellularly. Remember that we have a lot of potassium inside and only very little outside. So the diffusion gradient is massive. Now, we have a constant flow of potassium outside, uh, ions outside the cell. That means flow is current across a resistance. And then we have a voltage. We have a potential difference. And if you look at the solution for the Nernst equation for potassium, you will realize that it is actually very close to the result that you get for the resting membrane potential because the bulk part of the resting membrane potential is dependent on the sole, on the sole efflux of potassium. The five millivolt difference, well, you have other transport that are happening as well. You have the co-transport, as I mentioned before. You'll also have small movements of chlorides or calcium, for example, through other various channels. But fundamentally, the resting membrane potential is the consequence of the continuous efflux of potassium ions through potassium channels. And it is maintained by the continuous action of the sodium potassium ATPase. Almost every single cell, I think actually without exception, every single cell in the body does this. Um, yeah, um, from this, for the exam, I'm gonna warn you, these formulas are important, especially this one. This is a reworked version of the um, Ohm's law, but in a slightly more relevant context for us. Like Ohm's law, you have current is equal to G is the conductance. Conductance is one over resistance. And if you do the math, you can just solve for G and you can put G instead of resistance times the membrane voltage and the ion specific potential difference. This formula is crucial and I implore all of you to remember it for the final. I think for the cellular physiology, we've actually officially covered enough. And now I'm happy to answer 
any questions that you might have, I've linked all the resources below. I've also linked the uh, relevant page numbers if you want to check out diagrams in the book in more detail. And you will also get an idea of what books I'm using in order to um, teach you all of this stuff and the books with good diagrams, in my opinion, preferably Bora. Um, but uh, yes, so now we have time for as many questions as you like because we actually finished at a reasonable time. So in case you do, let me know. Also more general questions about this year. I mean, I haven't really been able to give you an introduction into what this year is gonna entail for you. So in case you have any questions, let me know. Anything that I mentioned unclear? Kind of expect nobody has any questions. Come on, give me something. Well, um, I don't see any questions. So if everything is close so far, I uh, thank you all for your attention. And um, I hope it was useful. If it wasn't, please let me know. If you have any feedback, let me know. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out even after this lecture. And I wish you all a very lovely remaining Sunday afternoon and best of luck for the coming partial tests. I wish you all the very best, and I'm going to end our presentation a little bit here now. Thank you very much. Thanks you all for coming. So. All right. How, how, how are the seminar tests? Okay, at least one question. How are the seminar tests? I can... Um, this lecture does not contain everything that you well, that we had to learn for the first uh, seminar test. Um, there's, uh, I think for the first seminar tests, we at least, I'm, done, I'm not sure, quite sure how it's going to be for you. We also have to remember action potentials. Um, if you do your due diligence and uh, read the text in the books, um, you should be fine. Not many people fail the seminar tests unless there was like some fundamental misunderstanding with the questions. Of course, that happens sometimes. But as long as you do some fair amount of revision, there shouldn't be any um, grand surprises. I can see whether I can like come up with like a um, like a question would be something along the lines. If I go back into my presentation for a second. Um, the questions would be something along the lines of, um, for this first test, um, what causes the resting membrane voltage? And the answers would be the constant shift of um, sodium into the cell or the action of the sodium potassium ATPase or the leaking of potassium. And the correct answer would be the leaking of potassium. So it is not rocket science. Um, I think the questions are reasonable. And um, Yes, I'm sure if you reach out to your fellow upper years, they might be able to help you out uh, with other past paper questions uh, along the lines. But um, yes, it is uh, nothing that we terribly afraid of. Any other questions? I'll be here as long as you like, if you haven't.
Well, if that is it, in that case, I'm going to conclude the stream today. And I hope to see you soon again, maybe. And I, yes, I wish you a very nice remaining Sunday and a uh, good physio partial test. Bye-bye.